Hello, everybody. Look. Hey, we came back to the ocean for us. It's right here. If you can't hear it. Oh, I forgot to plug this in. That's so funny. I put it in my ear. All right, today we're going to be reading through Evelyn Underhill's book. Um, Mysticism, studying the nature and development of spiritual consciousness. All right, and so I'll show you the ocean while we're right next to it, and then I'm going to move away from it a little bit. Just over here, so we'll be close. It's a different spot. So welcome, Evelyn Underhill, influenced C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, and she wrote this book in 1910. And um, she describes what mysticism is and how to understand it in a way that's just like solid, you know. It's like the way the saints understood it, not, not some weird occult way. You don't have to go in a cult way. That's the good news of all this. I don't know what all this stuff is, but... All right. So... Let me just set this up. You guys know the drill. Hopefully I don't have to get my tripod out. Probably I do, because this is crooked. Okay. I hope you're doing well. I was going to say... Welcome to this present moment. Whatever was going on earlier today, we have permission to let it go and just be here now and enter into this. Just, you know, give yourself to this place of understanding that this is where we are now. A bunch of birds are flying over, coming. Let's see if you'll get them. There they are. How's that for a show? Look at that line. All right. Let me open my bag. That's where the book is and we'll begin. No, I checked this in my car. That's quite a different sound from this, but just do our best. I'm putting you guys on a plant, but I'll, I'll move the leaves out of the camera. Here we go. Thank you, plant. All right, that's it. Here's our shot. Oh, if the sun comes out, though, I want to get the sunset. I hope you're well. Feel free to take a moment to give this a thumbs up. It helps other people know that this is available. It sends it out, the algorithm out. To the good old days. Right, here's the book. Okay, so we're starting on a new chapter. That's awesome. 
I forgot. We're on chapter seven, introversion, part two, contemplation. And I, I let you take a screenshot of this. I mean, it's free copyright anyway right now because it's so old. If you'd like to see, and then I'll read it anyway, what the summary of this book is. Oh, that's so funny. I was going to grab this to show the sunset anyway. Okay, contemplation, a state of attainment. Its principal forms, difference between contemplation and ecstasy. Contemplation defined, its psychology, Delacroix. It is a brief act, St. Augustine. It is in, ineffable and noetic. The noose is noetic, but anyway... Contemplation includes a large group of states. It, it's two marks, totality and self-mergence. Dionysius the Areopagite. It is a unitive act. Roisy Brooks, Hilton. What do mystics tell us of the contemplative act? Two things, loving communion and divine ignorance. Both represent temperamental reaction. The mystic usually describes his own feeling state. Richard Roll, two forms of contemplation, transcendental and immantal, immanental, I mean, contemplation of transcendence, the ven negative, of the, the via negativa, negativa, the, the road, the way of negative, where you're seeing, it, it, she'll describe it, uh, the divine dark, the desert of God, Tauler, Mater, Lenic, vision of transcendence, Dante, Angela of Foligno, contemplation of eminence, and experience of personality, divine love, these two forms, really one, both necessary, Ruzi Brooks combines them, the process of contemplation, Dionysius, the cloud of unknowing, Boheme, divine ignorance, Angelo of Foligno again, loving contemplation, St. John of the Cross, Roll, the orison, orison of union, necess necessary to description, to a description of the contemplative act. Deep Horizon, St. Teresa. So that's, whenever she says St. Teresa, she was from 1910, so she's talking about St. Teresa of Avila from the 1400s. Now, I'll, I'll talk for a second because this already brought, I'm a psychologist for the past 20 years, but I like, I'm like, I tonight definitely, I feel like it was, I uh, letting Evelyn Underhill speak for the most part. But while I get my, um, I'm going to um, get this thing out. We were reading in the Gospels this passage, and the person that was teaching about it commented, he commented as a man, that, you know, so when Jesus was 12, he went into the temple. I think it's in the beginning of Luke. And... Um, it's like his parents were looking for him, of course, for three days, just like the three days when we didn't understand, you know, we as like his disciples in the time, why he had to die, you know, where he was during the crucifixion. But anyway, he was, he just says, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And the other translation of that is, didn't you know, this is so cool. I was contemplating on this. He's like, didn't you know? I had, I had to be about my father's house. I had to be of my father's house. Because if you count the time in the womb, you know, then it says he was 12, but then Jewish people of that age, I heard, my dad used to tell me this, count the time in the womb. And so he would have been 13. So it's like bar, bat mitzvah time. So it would have been... As an adult, he had, to, he had to be about his father's business. But then he went with them and grew in favor and stature and, you know, wisdom and all that. But, um, oh, I know what I was bringing up for us, right? This is just like the mystic path. That's why I was bringing it up. He said, um, the guy that was teaching said, you have to be prepared for when God goes a different direction than you had you had planned or you had thought, you know, like, 
I'm sure Mary and Joseph thought, they thought he was with the company of people. And they had to go a day back and then get him and look, you know, she says, we were looking for you. Don't you know we were sorrowful looking for you? And he, it's, it's like, wist, it's in the, you know, in the old English, wist thou, why were you looking for me, <laughs> right? Why were you doing that? Okay, I gotta unplug that. Didn't, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? So maybe that'll come up. Sometimes when we go on these little diversions, um, it's like, whatever. I was saying, whatever diversions seem to just be part of, part of this, but, um, I pushed a button and it went off. So, all right, now we're going to, now we're going to really start. And there's the sunset right there. The clouds are just out. So we must now consider under the general name of contemplation, all those more advanced states of introversion in which the mystic attains somewhat the results and rewards of the discipline of recollection and quiet. If this course of spiritual athletics has done its work, he has now brought to the surface, trained and made efficient for life, a form of consciousness. A medium of communication with reality, which remains undeveloped in ordinary men. And so the last chapter she talked about how you do, you know, it's just like if you play the guitar, you're going to, I mean, she didn't bring up the guitar, I don't think, maybe an instrument, but you're going to get better over time. And so if you practice going into the quiet, it, it develops a muscle, it develops this capacity. Um, like I listened to uh, this guy named John Butler, and I just heard him talking the other day. He said, yes, I went to this school in London for 20 years to learn meditation, 20 years. And he's been doing it for 60 now because he's 80, you know? And so it's like, it, it, he developed the skill of turning off the outer mind that wants to chatter, chatter, chatter. And being able to, you know, in John 10, I think it says, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus is talking, I am the good shepherd, you know, not the transactional kind of love. I am the good, conscious, always leading you to highest consciousness, highest love. But I welcome all religions here. We're going, we're just studying mysticism together. All right. Uh, thanks to this faculty, he is now able to perform the characteristic mystic act to obtain a temporary union with that spiritual fount closed to all reactions from the world of sense where without witnesses of any kind, God and our freedom meet. Hmm. See, you're, you're exercising your freedom of will to get to that place. That's why, that's why it works because I was reading this one mystic and he was saying that all spiritual gifts that people have, have been worked on, developed. But I won't go get into how, you know. I mean, I think half the world maybe believes in past lives, but that's controversial for some people. But anyway, I let that go. We'll, we'll see what she talks about anyway. Um, thanks to this faculty, he is now able to perform the characteristic mystic act to obtain a temporary union with, quote, that spiritual fount closed to all reactions from the world of sense, where without witness of any kind, God and our freedom meet. Remember when Jesus says, you know, when you pray, go into your inner room and shut the door. Well, what do you think that means psychologically? You know, I wear this ring to remind, my, remind me to go into that inner room, go into the middle of the middle and shut the door to everything else of your other senses to practice that because I need reminders all the time. I've, 
we come back, we get hooked in because our senses are so dominant in this world. In the degrees of recollection, the self trained its the self trained itself in spiritual attention and at the same time lifted itself to a new level of perception where by means of the symbol which formed the gathering point of its powers it received a new inflow of life in the degrees of quiet with a capital q it passed on to a state characterized by a tense stillness in which uh, some people call it an alert stillness i just got back from a week long training of how to become a teacher of presence by Eckhart Tolle. Six days with him. Believe me, I didn't want to leave because you're just practicing presence on purpose all day, every day. And you, you, I was like that, like that one time, if you followed these videos, I was like, no, I never want to go back to egotism and to being hooked in and all that. It's like that one saint that was like, no more sin, God, no more. Let me just be in union with you. I came here once to this beach and I sang that song. Uh, Grease is the word that you heard. It's got groove, it's got meaning. I think I sang it down here. But Grease was like this holy anointing oil. And so I made, that whole song came to me a different way. But anyway, that's, that's just a side thing. There was some lyric that just came to me, but then it left. I don't think it was from that song, but it was like that. Anyway. Okay, so it uh, lifted itself up to a new level of perception where by means of the symbol which formed the gathering point of all its powers, it received a new inflow of life. In the degrees of quiet, it passed on to a state characterized by a tense stillness, alert awareness, alert stillness, right? In which it rested in that reality, capital R, at which as yet it dared not look. Now in contemplation, it is to transcend alike the stages of symbol and of silence and energize enthusiastically, she has that quoted, on those high levels which are dark to the intellect but radiant to the heart. We must expect this contemplative activity to show itself in many different ways and take many different names, since its type will be largely governed by individual temperament. It appears under the forms which ascetic writers call, quote, ordinary and extraordinary, infused or passive, contemplation, as that horizon of union, which we have already discussed. Sometimes, too, it shows itself under those abnormal psychological conditions in which the intense concentration of the self upon its overpowering transcendental perceptions results in the narrowing of the field of consciousness to a point at which all knowledge of the external world is lost. All the messages of the senses are utterly, utterly ignored. You know, like you read in the East of people that just sit in the rain and the, and the weather for I don't know how long, months. They just sit there and they're in almost like a catatonic state. Wasn't the Buddha like that? I can't remember offhand right now. If I could zoom in right there, there's like sun rays. You can see them going through the clouds. Maybe we'll see the sun peek through before it sets. I'm not blocking it, let's see. where the senses are utterly ignored, the subject then appears to be in a state of trance characterized by physical rigidity and more or less complete anesthesia. There are the conditions of, these are the conditions of rapture or ecstasy, conditions of which the physical resemblance to certain symptoms of hysteria have, uh -oh. It's like someone I know, but I'm not gonna, it's, it's not. Don't worry, um, I just, it's uh, important. Okay, so, I don't know if there's anything for me to say, I just have to pull my shirt down because otherwise I might look like a plumber when people are walking by. Not very many people right now. I know, TMI, okay, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I would, I just, I'm squatting up on this rock, so I have to bend my knees all weird because I don't have a chair. All right. 
I like it. I think John the Baptist lived in like a cave, you know, just like these rocks. That's what the extra biblical stuff says down by the Jordan, you know. Anyway. Oh, sorry if I breathe right into this. All right, let's let's just do this. One more moment. There. Um, these are the conditions of rapture and ecstasy. Conditions which the physical resemblances to certain symptoms of hysteria have so greatly reassured the enemies of mysticism. Okay, so they just call everything hysteria. You know what I mean? It's like if someone worked for 10 years to learn how to meditate and they go into a kind of catatonic state, you know, they're completely lucid and intelligent afterwards. Doesn't mean they were in hysteria, you know? Anyway, rapture and ecstasy differ from contemplation proper in being holy and voluntary states. Rapture, says St. Teresa of Avila, you know, who frequently experienced it, is absolutely irresistible. We cannot hinder it. Whereas the horizon of union, which is one of the forms in which pure contemplation appears at its highest point of development, is still controlled to a large extent by the will of the subject and may be hindered although that resistance be painful and violent. That's from the life of St. Teresa of Avila. The Vida. There is thus a sharp natural division, a division both physical and psychical, established between the contemplative and the ecstatic states, and we shall do well to avail ourselves of it in our examination of their character. First, then, as to contemplation proper, what is it? It is a supreme manifestation of that indivisible, quote, power of knowing, end quote, which lies at the root of all our artistic and spiritual satisfactions. Wow. In its man's, quote, made trinity of thought, oh, oh, a man's made trinity of thought, love, and will becomes a unity, okay? And so in us, it's our thought, love, and will becoming a unity. And feeling and perception are fused as they are in all our apprehensions of beauty and best contacts with life. It is an act not of the reason, but of the whole personality working under the stimulus of mystic love. Like I was saying about Greece, song. It's got who, it's got me. Greece is the way you are feeling. And he says something about this life. It's, I think it's Barry Gibb that wrote it. This life of illusion. What are we doing here? We take the pressure, we throw away conventionality belongs to yesterday. I won't do all of his lyrics because those are copyrights, so I was just quoting. All right. It is an act not of the reason, but of the whole personality working under the stimulus of mystic love. Hence, its results feed every aspect of that personality, minister to its instinct for the good, the beautiful, and the true. Psychologically, it is an induced state in which the field of consciousness is greatly contracted. The whole of the self, its cognitive powers being sharply focused, concentrated upon one thing. We pour ourselves out, or as it seems some, as sometimes seems to us, in, we pour ourselves in, towards this overpowering interest, seem to ourselves to reach it and be merged with it. Whatever the thing may be, be in this act. Whatever the thing Maybe in this act, we know it, 
as we cannot know it by the mere ordinary devices of thought. So you get a knowing, that's what she's describing. It's kind of like, the, you can see an example of this. I've, I've experienced this lots, but it doesn't, you know, let's just skip my examples for a second and go to the Bible. When Peter, when it's the Feast of Booths, you know, and Jesus is on the Mount um, of Transfiguration, and Elijah and Moses show up, Peter says, shall we set up a booth for, for Moses and for Elijah? You know, and it says he knew not what he was saying. Well, he didn't know in his mind, but obviously he knew. He just, you can just see. It's just like I was praying for someone and she was pregnant and I just saw, oh, it's a boy. And I wasn't looking and I, it's not like I remember seeing in her stomach anything. I just had this knowing she, it was a boy because we were doing these intense prayers. She had to get like this, uh, I don't know, it was like an MRI or something dangerous while she was pregnant. So we were all... You know, it was anyway, but the Holy Spirit can reveal certain things and you just have a knowing. And it was, it did end up being a boy. And, you know, even if it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't something I was trying to figure out. You just get a knowing about things. You know, you can feel like you've known someone. The lifeguards is driving past. Um or the sheriff. All right, so whatever the thing may be in this act, we knew it, as we cannot know it by the mere ordinary devices of thought. The turning of our attention from that crisp and definite world of multiplicity, right? This is duality that we're here. We're talking about going back up to the oneness. You know, this is the shadow lands. This is the real thing. But however much we buy into this shadow lands, that's how much we're going to experience. You know, that's why a kind of spiritual detachment is important, but that's what she's talking about. Well, the water's coming up. The turning of our attention from that crisp and definite world of multiplicity, that cinema... Cinemato cinematograph show with which intelligence is accustomed and able to deal has loosed new powers of perception which we never knew that we possessed. Instead of sharply perceiving the fragment, we feel the solemn presence of the whole. Deeper levels of personality are opened up and go gladly to the encounter of the, of the universe. Bob Marley has that quote, man is a universe within himself. And Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. And my friend Elliot Smith, I was just thinking of, you know, he's a singer, he's passed on, but he said, why would you want any other when you're a world within a world? You know, can't make a sound. His song's called Can't Make a Sound because you enter into this silent place. Nobody knows what he's doing still in the stillness, hanging like Christ on the cross, hanging around. You know, you're dying to... It's an elegant ego death. That's what I've been calling it lately. <laughs> You're dying to your old self. Dying to letting your senses dominate your life. Being pulled in here and there. And it doesn't happen unless we practice, unless we put down our phones, you know, or use it for purposes like this, <laughs> you know. Um, but discipline ourselves with our phones because otherwise we're just constantly using our senses and self-regulating, you know, calm, self-soothing with our phone, you know, like instant connection with other people on a superficial level, let's say. This isn't, of course, superficial, but <laughs> I'm not judging all the other stuff. I'm just saying it's like, oh, we get a quick dopamine high because we got 10 new likes from our friends and we feel like we connected with them. And it's like, well, who have you talked with today in, in person? You know what I mean? How did you treat the person in front of you? Anyway, when we practice those little ways each day, I was just listening to Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, on the way here, and he was saying, the quality of your consciousness right now in this moment is what determines the, like, your future. It's the quality of your conscious in this now moment. If, this, if, if I keep going for dopamine highs, then I'm building a habit of going for that. And it's going to be a lot harder to be quiet and enter into this. Anyway, 
Instead of sharply perceiving the fragment, we feel the solemn presence of the whole. Deeper levels of personality are opened up and go gladly to the, to the encounter of the universe. That universe, or some reality hid between it and ourselves, responds to the true, lovely will of our heart. Our ingoing concentration is balanced by a great outgoing sense of expansion of new worlds made ours as we receive the inflow of its life. Delacroix has described with great subtlety the psychological character of pure contemplation. All right, let's hear it. When contemplation appears, he says, A, it produces a general condition of indifference, liberty, and peace, an elevation above the world, a sense of beatitude. The subject ceases to perceive himself in the multiplicity and division of his general consciousness. He is raised above himself. That's why it feels so good, right? A deeper and a purer soul substitutes itself for the normal self. B, in this state in which consciousness of I-hood and the consciousness of the world disappear, the mystic is conscious of being in immediate relation with God himself, of participating in divinity. Contemplation installs a method of being and of knowing. Moreover, these two things tend at bottom to become one. The mystic has, like this, what I was saying, you know, the mystic has more and more the impression of being that which he knows and of knowing that which he is. So you feel yourself as being like one with God and you have this knowing that you are one, you know, like a drop in the ocean. You're not the one that created the ocean, uh, but when you, you are this drop and you merge in with the ocean, you feel like this whole ocean. That's why you feel like it. And of a knowing, um, a being that which he knows and of a knowing that which he is. So you know yourself as your isness, your isness beyond your name, beyond your skin color, behind, beyond the religion you identify yourself with. You, you get this oneness with divine love. Oh, and that Billie Holiday song was coming up when I was reading that part. Um, because Eckhart Tolle has this chapter, I think it's chapter 8, on enlightened relationships and the power of now. So worth listening to or, or reading that chapter, enlightened relationships. Because he says, when people first go into a relationship, this is part of the high that they feel. They think it's love, but it's not. It's trans. It's off. 90% of the time they say it's transactional, it's sadly, unless you get to an enlightened state because they say only less than 10% of people are in that enlightened type of way of operating. But, um, but he says you lose your sense of self in the other, you know? And so that song Billie Holiday sings like, they all disappear from you. I only have eyes for you. I had a cold, so I haven't been singing much lately. Um, but I only have eyes for you, dear. And just like all the people, they're walking by, but uh, not a cloud in the sky, something. Everything disappears. She's describing what contemplation is like. All, most of her songs are about this. You know, I cover the waterfront. Even Patsy Cline's songs are a lot like this. I go a walking after midnight. I have a whole playlist on my YouTube uh, of torch songs songs about the one that got away but they're all about divine union if you can look at it that way i used to have a playlist on home elliot and i made that playlist like we were talking about it because he liked kierkegaard and kierkegaard talked about the one beatific type regina was her name like lady queen you know or lady king queen anyway anyway now the object of the mystics contemplation is always some aspect of the infinite life of God, the one reality. Okay, and if you really, really, really want to know this, and then I'll keep letting her talk, is sit and contemplate for an hour, an hour a day, for seven days, on just the first verse of Psalm 23. David wrote us, you know, the Lord, and the word Lord is the I am, the I am, the eternal existing one, is my shepherd, which is also the word for best friend. Therefore, I lack nothing. When you keep sitting in that place, the I am is the shepherd of my soul, the keeper, the protector, the one that's guiding me towards this union 
the one that loves me, that nurtures me, the I am, the self-existing one, the eternal one, the one, the I am that I am, the isness of God is my shepherd. When you let God be your shepherd, you know, your will is going with that too, and your heart and your feelings and your mind, that's the trifecta right there. When you, when you ask God, if you don't feel that now, ask God, help me see you as my shepherd. Give me the wisdom to know that you are. Help me shift my consciousness and my will to let go of letting all these other things. When we're letting everything else be our shepherd, we're just letting other things be idols. We're not detached in the proper way. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not speaking like I have this perfect. I wish, I wish, but it's all right here in this moment. The, the I am is my shepherd and your shepherd. Anyway, it's a little extra homework assignment, homework, if you want to look at it like that. Home inside of me. Anyway, hence the enhancement of vitality which artists or other unselfconscious observers may receive from their communion with scattered manifestations of goodness, truth, and beauty is, in his case, infinitely increased. His uniformly rapturous language is alone enough to prove this. In the contemplative act, his whole personality, directed by love and will, transcends the sense world, casts off its fetters, and rises to freedom, becoming operative on those high levels where, says Tauler, reason cannot come. Tauler, T-A-U-L-E-R. There it apprehends. Ah, oh, look. It's so much a little more orange in my, in my perspective because I can see it closer. There it apprehends the super, super, it's a sunset. If you guys are listening to the podcast, the sun's setting. There it apprehends the suprasensible by immediate contact and knows itself to be in the presence of the, quote, supplier of true life with a capital L, right? Such contemplation, such attainment of the absolute is the whole act of which the visions of poets, the intuition of philosophers give us hints. It is a, a songstress, like Billie Holiday, is a poet, obviously, you know. That's why these songs express glimpses of these things. That's why people, my mom was out in, t- in, in town and went, what? Why would you, why would you teach a whole hour on the song, take me home tonight? I don't want to let you go till I see the light. You know, <laughs> because it's about taking someone home, but it's like taking me home to this place. When you, blessed are the pure in heart, you know, for they shall see God. You see God in everything. G.K. Chesterton told us that though. He said, every man in a brothel is looking for God. I don't recommend finding it there, but it's it's kind of um, you know you can you can be forgiving of people to understand that it's just like all of the you know if we go and get a double PhD at Harvard we could be looking for our identity our our God self by proving our egotistic worth. What's the difference, you know? Now, I'd, I think I'd rather get a double doctorate at Harvard, but still, it doesn't I mean Jesus could see through all of this stuff. That's why we, we don't judge people. Just let go of egotism wherever you are. <laughs> Whether you're in a brothel or at Harvard is my recommendation, but it's your life. There it apprehends the super sensible by immediate contact and knows itself to be in the presence of the supplier of true life. Such contemplation, such attainment of the absolute is the whole act of which the visions of poets, the intuition of philosophers, give us hints. It is a brief act. The very greatest of this of the contempl- contemplatives have been unable to sustain sustain the brilliance of this awful vision for more than a very little while, a flash, an instant, the space of an Ave Maria, they say. Oh, Ave Maria. Hail Mary, full of grace. She was in that state, so no wonder when you're singing that or praying it, you're joining in that state because she was in that. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. 
Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. One, us sinners just means those people missing the mark out of the state of high consciousness. That's what sin is, to miss the mark. But what Eckhart Tolle says the Greek is like to miss the whole point of your life, you know, because you're locked into egotism. But anyway... The space of an Ave Maria, they say. My mind, says St. Augustine, in his account of his first purely contemplative glimpse of the one reality, withdrew its thoughts from experience, extracting itself from the contradictory throng of sensuous images, that it might find out what that light was wherein it was bathed in an ellipsis. And thus, with the flash of one hurried glance, it attained to the vision of that which is. And then at last I saw thy invisible things understood by means of the things that are made, but I could not sustain my gaze. My weakness was dashed back and I was relegated to any, to my ordinary experience, bearing with me only a loving memory, as it were, the fragrance of those desirable meats on the which as yet I was not able to feed. Hmm. Like C.S. Lewis says, the, in the weight of glory, the fragrance of another world. You know, there's like this 3D rose. Rise, open your soul eyes. That's what rose means to me. I don't want to let you go until we see the light, you know. This light. This fragrance, as St. Augustine calls it, remains forever with those who have thus been initiated, if only for a moment, into the atmosphere of the real, with a capital R, right? And this, the immortal and indescribable memory of their communion with that which is, gives to their work the perfume of the inviolate rose. No way! Look, it's on, the sec it's on this page I just turned to, so I didn't know she was going to talk about the rose. And is the secret of its magic power. But they can never tell us in exact and human language what it was that they attained in their ecstatic flights towards the thought of God, their momentary emergence in the absolute life. Emergence, not emergence, emergence, like merging with. That which is, says St. Augustine, the one, with a capital O, the supplier of true life, says Plontius, the energetic word, says St. Bernard, eternal light, says Dante, the abyss, says Roisebrook, pure love, says St. Catherine of Genoa, poor symbols of perfection at the best. But through and by these oblique utterances, they give us the far more valuable assurance that the object of their discovery is one with the object of our quest. William James has well observed that ineffability and noetic quality are the constant characteristics of the contemplative experience. Those who have seen are quite convinced. Those who have not seen can never be told. There is no certitude to equal the mystic's certitude, no impotence more complete than that which falls on those who try to communicate it. And that's why I got in a fight with these people the other day, and I wish I hadn't been so triggered, you know, but it's like, I know this, but I couldn't explain to them how I knew it because they would freak out, you know. But I was like, no, no, no. Like, this soul thing that you're talking about is not what you're describing. But, you know, I like St. John of the Cross and the Scent of Mount Carmel. He really helps you. He keeps you humble because it's like even that just could have been, you know, you have to use discernment. Some, he says, don't hold tightly even to your visions because they could just be planted there or whatever. So, you know, it, it could have made me more humble in, in my interaction or more measured, I say. But you come off as arrogant because you just know. But it's just like if someone said, no, stop signs are green. And it's like, no, they're red. I know they're red, you know, unless I've been colorblind my whole life. And everybody in grade school always told me they're red. And you know what I mean? So it's like, of course, you're going to sound arrogant when you're like going, no, but then you can look at your egotism and be like, I don't have to prove to anyone anything. I don't have to prove a point. I can be detached from, they can have a different opinion than me. 
we just agree to disagree. Anyway, those who have seen are quite convinced, and those who have not seen can never be told. There is no certitude to equal the mystic certitude, no imp impotence more complete than that which falls on those who try to communicate it. See, it's, it's, it's like we feel impotent to communicate it. Of these most excellent divine workings in the soul, oh, here's a quote, of, those, of these most excellent and divine workings in the soul, whereby God doth manifest himself, says Angela of Foligno, quote, man can in no wise speak or even stammer. Over and over again, however, he has tried to speak, and the greater part, that was the end of the quote, of mystical literature is concerned with these attempts. Under a variety of images, by a deliberate exploitation of the musical and suggestive qualities of words, often, too, by the help of desperate, disparate, disparate, you know, not, not equal, paradoxes, those unfailing uh, stimulants of men's intuitive power, he tries to tell others somewhat of that veritable country which I hath not seen. His success, partial though it, it be, can only be accounted for upon the supposition that somewhere within us lurks a faculty which has known this country from its birth, which dwells in it and partakes of pure being, and can, under certain conditions, be stung to consciousness. Okay, okay. So here's a verse. There's always going to be a verse. If you're getting a true knowing of something, there's always going to be a verse. Not just pulling a verse out of nowhere, but I was directed for reasons of a meeting that I have tomorrow to, to do my best to, to contemplate, memorize Psalm 22. And so that's, it starts, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 on the cross, you know, and it says, why do you not hear me? And then a couple verses later it says, but even that, I know you are hearing me. It's like God, God didn't not hear Jesus. Do you know what I mean? So he didn't abandon him either, but I don't need to go into that. But there's a verse that says, I, in that Psalm, in Psalm 22, in the middle of it or so, it says, I have known you since I was in my mom's stomach, my mother's stomach. It's so cool. It's like since the womb. Oh, look at the sun. It's peeking out right there when I say that. We get to see it. Hi. That's awesome. It's like orange red where I see it. I, I wonder if I can, let's see if I can. Ooh, I can darken it a little. I'll be dark, but the sun will be bright. All right. So it, she just said over and over again, however he has tried to speak, uh, okay, uh, under a variety of images by deliberate exploitation of the musical and suggestive qualities of words often, too, by the help of disparate paradoxes, those unfailing stimulants of man's intuitive power, he tries to tell others somewhat of that veritable country which I hath not seen. His success, partial though it may be, can only be accounted for upon the supposition that somewhere within us lurks a faculty which has known this country from its birth. From before your birth, right? It says in Psalm 22 and in Psalm 139, you know, you've knit me together in my mother's womb. But Psalm 22 is like, I have clung to you, God, in my mother's womb. Or it's, it's something like that when you read the Hebrew. It, it, it felt like that to me, at least. It was very comforting. Which dwells in it partakes of pure being and can understand certain conditions and can, under certain conditions, be stung to consciousness. Then transcendental feeling, waking from its sleep, acknowledges that these explorers of the infinite have really gazed upon the secret plan. Now I'm going to watch the sun for a second. Is um, C.S. Lewis says, you know, if we went back to the song, we would see it was not in the song or the painting or, you know, that feeling that we wanted. It only came through the song. It was our longing. If something in this world, if nothing in this world can satisfy us, he's, he makes this lo logical syllogism, then it's, it has to be something that we were made for another world. 
This is a lot more pretty, but... If nothing in this world can satisfy us, then we know that we are made for another world. Well, we just got a glimpse of the sun, so it went back under a cloud. I'll make it bright for us. All right. If nothing in this world can satisfy us, hmm. it's hinting to us that we were made for another world. Anyway, new contemplation is not... Oh, now, contemplation is not, like meditation, one simple state governed by one set of psychic conditions. It is a name for a large group of states, partly governed, like all other forms of mystical activity, by the temperament... Sorry, I had a cold recently, and I was crying this morning. I can't, I can't say what, because it's someone else's private information, but it was temporarily quite sad. You can always pray for, for me and for the people on this channel, for each other. Because if you take this path, you're going to be like Arthur O'Shaughnessy's ode. It's so good. Wandering by lone sea breakers, right? But we are the movers and the shakers of this world forever, it seems. Lonely something. Anyway, it's a beautiful... We are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. It's worth praying for people around here, for sure. I mean, we can pray for the whole world, but anyway. By the temperament of the subject and accompanied by feeling states, which vary from the extreme of quietude or peace in life knotted. Not, you know, you, you knot you knotted, N-A-U-G-H-T-E-D, knotted everything else out. To the rapturous and active love in which thought into song is turned. Some kinds of contemplation are inextricably entwined with the phenomena of intellectual vision and inward voices. In others we find what seems to be a development of the quiet. Um, she says, compare Baker, Holy Wisdom, Treatise 3, and Hilton, Scale of Perfection. He has a scale of it. Anyway, a state which the subject describes as a blank absorption, a darkness, or a contemplation in caligine? C-A-L-I-G-I-N-E. Caligine? I, I don't know what, what language that is. Sometimes the contemplative tells us that he passes through this darkness to the light. Sometimes it seems to him that he stays forever in the beneficent dark, dark, in the beneficent dark. In some cases, the soul says that even in the depths of her absorption, she knows her own bliss. In others, she only becomes aware of it when contemplation is over and the surface intelligent resumes the reins just made a video where I was getting a vision of the horse instead of you driving the horse the horse is driving you and I have this wild horse I, I, I can I mean the graphics by me not, not very complicated graphics but I um, I know it's a video where I'm vertical but and I know I say at the beginning I did this on a Saturday It, I think it's how the the only true way to get over the narcissist. I really, yeah, it's that video. So if you want to watch that. So the surface intelligent resumes the reins. In this welter of personal experience, experiences, it becomes necessary to adopt some basis of classification, some rule by which to distinguish true contemplation from other introversive states. Such a basis is not easy to find. I think, however, that there are two marks of the real condition, A, totality, and B, self-mergence, you're merging with. And these we may safely use in our attempt to determine its character. Whatever terms he may employ to describe it, and however faint or confused his perceptions may be, the mystic's experience in contemplation is the experience of the all, you know? It is the absolute which he has attained, not as in meditation or vision, some partial symbol or aspect thereof. You know, like the vision I got of 
the horse-drawn carriage turning into the horse driving us and we're in the harnesses that's not a vision of being one with the all that's the our lord the lord is my shepherd therefore i lack nothing there's nothing you lack no thing because you don't need anything <laughs> This attainment is brought about, this knowledge gained, by way of participation, not by way of observation. The passive receptivity of the quiet is here developed into an active, outgoing self-donation. You're donating yourself, right? Like, like Eliot said in his song, nobody knows nobody. <laughs> his own body doesn't even know. His mind doesn't. Nobody knows what he's doing, still hanging around can't make a sound like it, I just got a and he was my friend you know but I don't think I don't know if I heard that song until after his death I can't remember right now but I got a vision of it just in a meditation anyway he got an Oscar nomination for best song written for the movie Goodwill Hunting do you miss me miss misery because <laughs> we're miserable able to be a miser with love when we stay in egotism, it's utterly miserable. I'll tell you from my own experience if you don't know. <laughs> I mean, you can run from one pleasure to the next, but anyway, it, that, doesn't, that doesn't take away this. Anyway, this attainment is brought about, this knowledge gained by way of participation, not by way of observation. The passive receptivity of the quiet, with a capital Q, is here developed into an active out going self-donation a quote give and take a divine osmosis is set up between the finite and the infinite life not only does the absolute pour in on the self but that self rushes out willingly to lose itself in it that dreadful consciousness of a narrow and limiting eyehood which dogs our search for freedom and full life is done away thank you jesus please make it happen for a moment, at least, the independent spiritual life is achieved. The contemplative is merged in it, like a bird in the air, like a fish in the sea, loses to find and dies to live. You know, like Jesus says, he who, he who wants to find his life must lose it, and if you lose your life, you'll find it. He says, for my sake, for Christ's sake, for the sake of what Christ showed us. He showed us how how to let go of our outer life. What, pro what is it, he said, Jesus said, what is a prophet, a man, if he gains the whole world that uses his, loses his soul? If you gain your soul and you lose the whole world, then that's it, right? We must, says Dionysius the Areopagite, can contemplate things divine by our whole selves, standing out of our whole selves, becoming holy of God, W-H-O-L-L-Y. This is the passive union of contemplation, a temporary condition in which the subject receives a double conviction of the ineffable happiness and ultimate reality. <clears throat> they said earlier a bliss state. You know, I studied this teaching on the Aramaic of um, Jesus teaching the Beatitudes. And she mentioned the Beatitudes too. And it says, blissful are those. Blissful are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled blissful were those. The Aramaic, they said, is the state of, of bliss, you know, of those blessed are those who, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All of the blessings, right? You can look at those and see how they teach you how to be in the state of oneness and bliss. He may try to translate this conviction into something said or something seen, but in the end, he will be found to confess that he can tell nothing save by implication. The essential fact is that he was there, as the essential fact for the returning exile is neither landscape nor language, but the homely spirit of place. You were there, right? To see and have seen the vision, that vision, excuse me, uh, says Pontius, as one of his finest passages, quote, is reason no longer, it is more than reason, before reason and after reason, as also is the vision which is seen. And perhaps we should not here speak of sight, for that which is seen, if we must need speak of seer and seen as two and not one, 
it is not dis discerned by the seer nor perceived by him as a second thing. Therefore, this vision is hard to tell of. For how can a man describe as other than himself that which he discerned it seemed not other, but one with himself indeed? All right. So you, once you name it, you're in the memory of it. You know, oh, shoot, the tassel fell off. Oh, there it is. I got it. Um, and it was reminding me, this is a little bit different. I'm going to wrap it up. It, it does remind me um, of Lucy when she went first to Narnia, you know, in the first Narnia book. Um, excuse me. She says, I know it happened, but I don't know how. You know, she knows she was there. She had the experience of meeting Mr. Tumnus the fawn. But she can't explain it to other people, and she doesn't understand why the door closed and why they couldn't see it. And, you know, this is just like what happens with the mystic. C.S. Lewis is, I mean, he said every book of his quotes directly or indirectly George MacDonald. Well, George MacDonald, all of his books, this is why I read two of George MacDonald's books on my channel already, The Princess and the Goblin, The Princess and the Curdy. He's always talking, he's teaching you about these uh, spiritual planes of existence and how to navigate through them. And Tolkien is doing the same in The Lord of the Rings. But, and C.S. Lewis said every book he ever wrote, he either yeah, quoted directly or indirectly George MacDonald. All right. I wish you so much love. I appreciate you being here. Make sure to like and subscribe because you don't know if this, these videos are going to come to you another time. I, don't, I, um, I welcome you here. I welcome all the new people. We've got lots of new people. And um, all right. Let me tie this and then I'll, I'll wave goodbye. Much love.